Okay, I think we're going to get started. I think we're going to get started. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone for coming. As always, thank you to Stuart Rosenthal and Aaron Shalom for encouraging us with this idea. We are here for a series on Hallel. If you're following in the Art Scroll, English Hallel can be found on page 632. Um, Hallel is something we're very much used to, but the whole concept of it is really an interesting thing. Uh, Hallel is of rabbinic origin. The concept of saying Hallel uh, on specific days is of rabbinic origin. Um, there are, it's interesting, the Spartan have a practice that they don't always make a bracha on halal. To, this, to us, it's Ashkenazim at least, it's such a basic thing to make a bracha on halal. So we have certain days where we say a complete halal and certain days where we say half halal. And you know, you always have to feel for those day school kids who came to, came to school one day for davening and the teacher said they were going to say half halal and they realized they were saying 80% halal and they thought they would have, you know. But uh, the idea of saying half halal, as we call it, is because there are certain days where there's a nice idea to say halal, but it's not the same concept of saying halal. And the rabbis wanted to make a distinction <coughs> between when you make a complete halal and when you say only a partial halal. So for us Ashkenazim, the distinction is just in terms of what chapters of, of Psalms we say. Actually, for at least many of the Sephardim, the distinction is if they make a bracha on it or not. That if it's a day that they say have halal, they, they, don't, they don't make a bracha on it. It's uh, extremely appropriate that we're doing this series leading up to Hanukkah. Um, Hanukkah is one of the days that we say whole halal, complete halal, because part of the institution of the day are, are these days of Hanukkah, are lahodos u lahalel, to give thanks, and lahalel is the same verb as, as halal, to give praise to Hashem. So the rabbi said, even though the holiday is rabbinic in its entirety. So the last day of Pesach, the yomtiv of the splitting of the sea, we don't say a complete halal. But for the eight days of Hanukkah, or rabbinic holiday, we say a complete halal each day. So the day, that, there's, when you think about it, there's very little that we do on Hanukkah that's unique to the day. We, we light a menorah that takes maximum five minutes. You know, if, a person, if you have a number of menorahs and you're not so good at it, maybe it takes five minutes. Um, it, 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 eating a sufganiyot is definitely not a Torah-level mitzvah. <laughs> And we say Allah Nisim, it's important, thank you. We say, we say Allah Nisim in, in, in Shimon Esrei and Benching, and we say Halal, we say Halal every day. So Halal was really a core component of the, of the days of Hanukkah. Um, it's very interesting, just before we start, I'm reminded of the story that there was someone who came to his rabbi and was looking for a subject to study, or a subject to study. And the rabbi said, you know, I think the book of Psalms, Tehillim, is a wonderful subject. And the person went and he studied it, checked back with the rabbi after a while, so the rabbi said, how'd you like it? The rabbi said, you know, I'm so unimpressed. This author of Tehillim, David Amelach, he just opened up a sitter and, and, and took lines <laughs> and from the sitter. So, so that is, so just to warn you, um, that's how Halal is, whatever it is, six, seven chapters of Tehillim. Uh, the Gemara says that these chapters, and they're in succession, by the way. The Gemara says that these chapters of Tehillim were inspired by the experience of Klal Yisraeli after the splitting of the sea. So the, 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 the basic way to understand it would be these are the praises that Klal Yisrael said after the splitting of the sea, and David, in his divine inspiration, recreated them in Tehillim. But that's it's something, I mean, we'll see. There, there, there are numerous references to the experience as we go through Malah, but something to think about. So this is the first moment as a nation, that Klal Yisrael turned to God as a group and gave thanks, and that for every holiday that we give thanks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we run back to that experience of, of the thanksgiving to God at the sea. It's a very powerful thing to think about. Um, just a little more general about how before we, we really roll up our sleeves. So, Yom Tovim we say halal on, right? So Pesach we already referred to, we say halal. Sukkot we say halal. Sukkot is all about giving thanks to God for the experience of the Jews in the desert, we say halal. Shavuos is about giving thanks to God for the giving of the Torah. We say halal. Hanukkah we discussed. Purim is actually an interesting question. We don't say halal on Purim. Isn't there a good miracle that we're celebrating on Purim? So there's different answers. One answer is the reading of the Megillah acts as a halal in its own right. That's what's halal, giving praise to Hashem and giving thanks. Look at the story. We make a very big to-do of the story. Um, there's another very famous answer given, which we'll touch on in a few moments. But there's one day that we say halal 
you know, in, in the traditional Jewish liturgy, that it's really fascinating that we say it, which is Rosh Chodesh. What happened on Rosh Chodesh? So Rosh Chodesh is a very nice day in the Jewish calendar. It's a day that we celebrate our connection to God, that he empowers the Jewish people to create a calendar. So the basic explanation given as to why we say Halal on Rosh Chodesh is the rabbis instituted it, that periodically we should just give praise to Hashem for all the goodness in our life. And, and that basically the very act of praising Hashem, when there's not a dramatic event for which we're praising Hashem, should in its own right be a merit that we should continue to have things for which to praise God in our lives. So that, that's the idea of saying Halal on Rosh Chodesh, a very interesting thing to think about. Okay, um, let's get started. Uh, just a disclaimer, uh, actually some people might even remember, we, we, we did these chapters in our Tehillim class, the Wednesday morning class. Uh, and most of these chapters we would take a full, we would take a full 45 hour time just for one chapter. We're, that's not the goal here, uh, so we're going to have to go a little bit quicker, uh, but it will at least touch on, on hopefully some, some meaningful themes. Okay, so again, we're on page 632 in the Art Scroll English. Um, and it's Psalm 113. Now, it's interesting, this psalm is really not about the Jewish experience leaving Egypt. So even though we just said this is all supposed to be about the experience after this one, you see this is not about it. And the Radak explains that before we get into the story of the Exodus, any aspect of the Exodus, we just want to recognize the fact that God in general brings his, his strength and might to the world, and specifically in the aspect in which God raises up those that are downtrodden, and if they deserve it, lowers those who have been lofty up until now, which of course is a very significant theme of the Egypt of the Exodus from Egypt, but we, we point it out in general. It's a powerful thing because if we just start talking about Egypt, then in a sense, our whole relationship with God revolves around Egypt. There's a relationship with God before Egypt, there's a relationship with God after Egypt, and the Egypt experience, that exodus, it gives an even greater inspiration, an even greater perspective, but that's not, that's not it in its entirety. Um, the Rav Hirsch comments, and this is a theme we'll touch on in a few different ways in this chapter, that a major theme of this chapter is the difference between the Jewish concept of God and the concept of God of other faiths. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into that, God will. Okay, let's get started. How, Haluka, halu de Hashem, halu Hashem Hashem. Praise God. Servants of God praise. Praise the name of God. That's a lot of praising. So three times, three in, the, in one verse. So the Radak says that the point is we're trying to bring out how incumbent upon us it is to be praising God. So we emphasize it three times. Um, why do we say that the servants of God should praise God? Whoever's listening should praise God. Why specifically the servants of God? So the Radak says that only a person who's truly a servant of God knows what's appropriate to say in praise of God. In, in other words, I, 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 if I'm not plugged in, in a certain sense, to an appreciation of God in this world, I don't even know what I'm talking about. And, and that, that's, that's what the Radak says. So only someone who's truly a servant of God can even find the words to appropriately praise him. The Sfas Emes says something that's really kind of the other way around. The Sfas Emes says, if a person is ready to pause for a moment and really say praise to Hashem, they inherently become a servant of God. Which, which is a little more of, of, a, of, a, positive, uh, of a positive thought uh, to think about. It's a very powerful thing. So that means that if I certainly relative to think about the eight days of Hanukkah, but anytime we say hello, if I can just take a step back, it doesn't have to be a day we say hello, if I can just take a step back and reflect and see the greatness of God in my life and really think about it for a moment, I inherently have already become more connected to him and my life has taken on more of a direction. Um, okay. Yihi shem Hashem mevorach me'atov yadolam. May the name of God be blessed from now and forever. So there's an interesting shift. We started off by talking about praising God, Hallel, and now we talk about God's name being blessed. That's a different root, that's a different word. What's the difference between God's name being praised and God's name being blessed? An interesting question. So the Malbim says 
that, and this is a very famous idea in other contexts, that bracha is recognition that an entity is the source of all good. And it's in a very literal way, the root of baruch means abundance. So the Malbum says as follows. The Malbum says, to have something great happen in my life and say, thank God, you know, no atheist in a foxhole. Some, something, someone gets saved from something, whatever it is, someone wins the lottery, thank God. That's hollow. That's, that's praise. Bracha is a person has an experience and they think about it and they say, not only was this a great thing that I experienced, but I've thought about this and I now realize that if I see this as being the hand of God, that gives me a perspective on everything else in my life and everything else that happens in the world. That, that's like an illuminating experience. That's bracha. So we start off by saying, everybody has to praise God. What are you? Do, do you not have a mind? Do you not see there's a God? Do you not, do you not see there are things that happen in your, in your life that, that are worthy of praising? It's, it's an instruction to everyone to bless him, uh, to praise him, excuse me. But the Malbum says the next Pasuk is like, a, is like, a, like a, a statement of hope. That it would be wonderful if the name of God could be blessed. Meaning that people really get, really, really get that he's the source of everything. Interesting thing. Mimizrach Shemesh Ad from the rising of the sun to its setting, Mehulal Shem Hashem. God's name is praised. So that fits very well with this mountain. No, I mean, it's, it's wonderful, but it's not so unique to be able to say Halal on Hashem. The, the more unique thing is to say Brach on Hashem. Okay. Ram al kol goyim Hashem al hashamayim kivoto. God is loftier than any of the nations. His glory is on the heavens. Where did that fit in? So we say that everyone recognizes God from one end of the world to the other. Everyone recognizes God. We say God's bigger than it all. So, so the Radak says that even though everyone is praising God, and that's wonderful, we need to recognize that the true praise of God is far loftier than whatever we can express. It's this struggle we've certainly discussed in the context of prayer and other, in other settings too. You know, on the one hand, if I don't see a connection to myself and God, it's very hard to praise Him. On the other hand, there's always a danger. If I, if I see myself as too connected, I, I, I no longer appreciate the big picture. I no longer appreciate how lofty God is. So the Radak says, we say that everyone needs to praise God, but then we also need to recognize that, oh my gosh, He's so much loftier than any of us. That's how the Radak understands it. Um, the Malbim says that, remember we said that part of what's going on in this chapter is there's a contrast between the Jewish concept of God and the, those of other, of other nations, possibly. So the Malbim says that this is actually a continuation of what they're saying from one end of the world to the other. The previous verse had been from one end of the world to the other, the name of God is praised. Then we say, you know, God is loftier than all the nations. His glory is in heaven. And this is always one of the big things that we are very proud of in Judaism. When we say in Judaism, we recognize that not only is God lofty and mighty, but God is interested in all of us too. But some people can praise God and just see him as Ram al Yim Hashem. Wow, he's really high up there. Al Hashemayim Kvodo. He has the seats all the way up high. And what we now emphasize is we have an, that's true, but we have an additional understanding of God. And that's the next verse. Mi kashem alokeinu hamagbi lashavas. Who is like Hashem our God who sits in, 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 in such a lofty place and yet, Hamashpili Liros that lowers himself to come down and see in heaven and earth. Um, and, and this is a point that, that Rav Hirsch, among others, says that this is the personal perspective of God. That God is so lofty 
but he's also Hashem Elokeinu, our God, that we have a connection to, who sits up high and comes down low. So just to sort of sum up where we're at so far, we started out talking about the idea of everyone needs to praise God, to see God in their lives. Then an even loftier plane than that for to hope to aspire to is to not only see God in our lives, but to use that as a connector. I saw the hand of God in this moment, and that extends to a whole new understanding of, of how I look at God in my life, in my world in general. We recognize that God is praised from one end of the world to the other. We recognize that God is extremely lofty, which could mean one of two things. It could either mean, however much I praise him, he's so far beyond me, but I need to praise him as best I can. The other possibility is, sometimes people make a mistake. Sometimes people think he's only lofty. And then we, we respond to that mistake by saying, yeah, but, but our God, our God, the God that we know, not just you know, a, a God that, that you know, conceptually created a world that we don't have anything to do with, our God not only sits up in a lofty place, but also comes down to this world. And all of this is part of praising God. Mikimi may have far He raises up from the dirt, the, the downtrodden person. May ashpos yorim He raises up from the the like ashpos is like the heaps, the trash heaps. He raises up the destitute person. Lo shivi imidivim ridiveyamo to place them with the nobles of his people. Okay, and we'll talk about the last verse in a moment. Um, Rav Hirsch has a beautiful point over here. Afar is dirt, the dust. Okay, Dust is naturally a lowly thing. Ashba is a trash heap, a mound of garbage. Ashba is a lowly thing because we make it so. <laughs> if everyone's with me so far. It's, offer, it's, it's the dirt. It's the dirt on the ground. Ashpa, the only thing that's lowly about an ashpa is people, this used to be a fine spot, just everyone took their garbage and put it there. God helps in two different ways. There are situations where you have a person who is so down and out because that's the nature of their life. Heaven forbid, they're created with, with, with terrible challenges or Life's path leads them to terrible, terrible challenges. And God can raise a person up from the dust. There's another type of person that is only where they are because of the decisions people around them have made about them. The person who's in the ashba, the person who's in the garbage heap, so to say. In other words, the first example is, let's say, a person who's a victim of, of, of their situation. Second example is a person who's a victim of circumstances, which could be overlapped. But the point is, this person is down and out because people threw, people counted them out. You know what? That person can be raised up also by God. Either way, either because the circumstances are so impossible, that person can be raised up, and the person just has been given a raw deal by the people around them for whatever reason it may be. God can raise up that person also, and each of these, as we think about it, create their own challenges and, and difficulty. Okay. Now, the Svas Emma says, you know, what, what does an evyon mean anyway? An evyon is related to the word ta'ev. Ta'ev is a person who's very much wanting, who's very much needing. So a person who desperately needs things, needs everything. They need food, they need drink, they need shelter, <coughs> they, they need everything. They're an evyon. They're a person who's all about ta'ev. Uh, a nadiv is literally a generous person, but the point in the context is they're a person who's really like a leader in society. So what group of people can you think of that went from being needy, downtrodden, on the, the, the ladder of life, to being a distinguished group of people? That, that the world could look to for guidance. Klal Yisrael. So Sfas Emes says that's the pshat for the Pasuk. Very nice pshat. May Ashpos Yerim Evyom. From the garbage heap, God pulled up Klal Yisrael out of the heap of Mitzrayim, that we were lowly slaves, to make them Nadivim. 
people of greatness, people of sophistication, people who can, who can be a, a light unto the nations. And, and that, so it's a fascinating way of thinking about the Jewish experience as a portal to, to each and every one of our lives and, and, and all of mankind. Moshivi akeres habayis, aim habonim smecha haluka. That God can take the, the, the woman who is barren of children and can make this woman a, a happy mother of children. Praise God. What's the shot of this passage? So the Radak says, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the most dramatic examples of changing nature. And this is within God's hands. And, and uh, God's constant ability to change situations, which we were just talking about a passage ago. But it's also interesting to think about Rashi. Rashi says that this is actually a mushal for Zion, for the Jewish people in the fully redeemed state. They got right. In other words, when, when the Jewish people are in exile, you look at, at Israel, Yerushalayim, and it's, it's like that Karis of Ice, like the mother without children. And then when everyone comes back, speaking of the United day, it's Eim HaBadim Smecha. And of course, the happy mother of children, and of course, that fits in to the whole image of Klaus Yisrael with the Exodus. That there was a time where what, what, what relevance did Yerushalayim have to the Jewish people? The Jewish people are in Egypt, slaves. And then the, 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 the fact that the day can ultimately come, and again, it's so remarkable to think about David Amelech's composing to Hillel, <coughs> and he's Gesundheit, he's sitting here thinking about when the temple is going to be built, and he's writing about these people who were slaves. You know, you take the, 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 barren, the barren woman and, and, and make her uh, with, with, happily with a number of children. So just to, to sum up the, the last part here of this chapter, we're talking about the fact that God can flip things at any moment. And God can, can flip things for the lowly, destitute person, and God can flip things for the lowly, destitute nation. Um, I do want to point out that it's very nice. In this chapter, we do not, and I, I think I misspoke when I introduced this chapter, there is nothing in this chapter about lowering those that were high. It's only about raising those that were low. Now, we see the lowering goes to high in other places and in, in, in Tehillim and elsewhere, for full disclosure, but we're just emphasizing at this moment God's, God's ability and willingness to raise people up to a very high place. Um, we will take some comments, questions. Arlene? I just want to say that I always view Nadim as benefactor mm -hmm. from the word Nidava. Absolutely. Because so, they have it, Marsville translated as nobles, and I think that doesn't really capture it. Yeah, so, so the truth is, thank you for commenting on that, I mean the truth is, that's fast emiss that we were saying fits very well with the idea of nobles, but I agree with you, what it really means is, is benefactor. I'll tell you honestly what I normally think when I say this, um, if I'm thinking, uh, what, I, what, I, what I think is that, you know, you have a person who's in terrible need, God connects the person in need to the benefactor. And, and, and that's a tremendous kindness in its own right. And, and uh, that, of course, is, is one of our greatest challenges when saying Hallel, that it's hard for us to see the hand of God in our own successes, and sometimes it's even hard for us to see the hand of God in the kindness done by others. But it, we can give the person credit for doing kindness, but we can also thank God for creating the circumstance that we met. And, and that absolutely fits, of course, with Nadav as a benefactor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Aaron. I was thinking when I was reading this, to seat them with nobles, with the nobles of his people, that almost makes it seem like the, the, de the destitute and the needy that we're talking about don't necessarily belong to his people at this point. Meaning, it could be that they're destitute and needy spiritually, mm -hmm. and he raises them to to come into the fold of his own people. Could very, very well be. Could very well be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any, anything else before we? Deb? Yeah. Well, I remember seeing in a, in a yeshiva uh, direct, I mean, a brochure for a dinner that the, that the honorees for the Akira Akira Sabayas. Sabayas, right? yeah. and, and, and talking about the wife, right. was, thank God, not barren. So right. um, I was, and, and I know that the word Akaras comes from Ikar, right. which means like the, um, 
the main, essence. the main, the essence. Yes, yes, uh, that's certainly true, and and yet, and yet there is certainly a usage of of, of a care, Akhara, Thank you, as 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 being a bare moment. There, there, it's a strange. Again, it, it, there must be something to that. Uh, what the inherent connection between those two is, I'm really not sure. I mean, I'm really I not could, sure, I but it, you're right. I'm sorry. I could posit a sure, question. please. If you think that the essential purpose of a woman is to have children, then a woman who doesn't have children would be lacking the uh, essential purpose. But then wouldn't, but then if anything, the, the root should be anything but. Yeah, you, 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 know, you know what I mean? I, mean, that, I, see, I think you're right, I see that connection, but it's still like such a like a, so, we're, well, we're like all the other letters taken God, already. You say, bless God, you know, like. Right. You, you but know. that's euphemistic. Oh, so maybe you mean, maybe it's meant in euphemistic, you mean. Maybe. That could be. Thank you. Maybe last thing before we, we unless it's on this. It is. Okay, on this, yeah. Um, so that Shoris is also used to mean uprooting. Yes. So yes. Up, right. Children, so that's good. That's good. So, so the Shoresh, the Shoresh means to uproot. Which, by the way, that makes so so a woman who, who, who doesn't unfortunately have that that opportunity to have children has had a, a, a part of her uh, feminine you know feminine potential uh, a part of her feminine potential uh, uprooted, and that makes sense because ikar is the main thing, the root, mm -hmm. and to be okir is to undo the root. Still, it gets back to the opposites, but, but that's not euphemistic. I mean, that, that's, that's, yeah, I think that's, I think that's correct. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, last thing, and then we're, you know what, actually, maybe let's, it's on this, Debbie, or it's something else? It is on this, but it's very small. Okay. <laughs> okay. I just to say that Judy had a very good explanation, and that I liked it a lot, and that was that a woman who doesn't have children would be lacking the ikar of, of, and the care of the bias. She's, she is the ikar, whether, even when she doesn't have children, and that when she act, then she becomes transformed when she also has children. But in other words, it doesn't take away from the fact that thank you. she's in a carousel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Eli, did you want to say something? I just had a question as to if you heard anything about anything about the style, how I mean, the words like hamabihi, it could be hamabihi, you know, right. adding the yud to all these mashpihi, this is, thank you for raising that. I'm sorry for not commenting on it. It is a very common thing in this chapter, and it's not only going to be this one. Uh, many words end off with a yud, and it's hard to see grammatically what the yud is doing at the end of the word. Uh, the, the traditional approach is this is, is, is somewhat of a poetic uh, poetic license here in Tehillim. Uh, again, Tehillim is very different than, let's say, the Torah, you know, in terms of the, the precision of things. On the one hand, and on the other hand, Tehillim is supposed to work with a certain amount of, of poetry and rhythm, etc. But it's it's um, it's it, that's the standard approach as to why these yuds. Uh, I know it didn't really answer your question, essentially repeating your question as a statement. But um, but that that's the idea. Yeah. Okay. Let's go on to the next chapter. Um, and the next chapter. Now we talk about the excess of the Jewish people from Egypt, which remember is officially what we're really what we're really supposed to be talking about in this hall. Beteis Yisrael Mitzrayim, Beis Yaakov. Me'am Loes. Now, this is already a little bit funny. So when Israel, the nation, left Egypt, when the house of Jacob left a nation of a foreign tongue. Okay, so obviously we're dealing with a certain amount of poetry here in terms of the repetition, but is there any significance to... The Malbim, by the way, just as an aside, the Malbim is a, a beautiful commentary on Tehillim in general because he's so into nuances and language and so many things learned down from it. So he, he suggests that um, the Jewish people were in different places. Some of the Jewish people happened to just be living in Egypt. You know like we say in the Haggadah, you know, that, that Yaakov didn't go down to Egypt to live there. He, he was just like temporarily, temporarily there, but he wasn't going to become an Egyptian, so to say. You know, he was kind of his own identity. So the Malbim says that there were people in Israel, famously, Yaakov's original name was Yaakov, and then when he defeated the angel, he was named Yisrael. So Yisrael is a name, an association of greater achievement. 
So there were certain people who were on a very lofty spiritual plane, the Israels of the people, they physically left Egypt. Because that's all that they were there. They were physically in Egypt, and then they physically left Egypt. The rest of the people, like everybody else, the base Yaakov, not Israel, but Yaakov, left a foreign nation. But that meant they were part of that nation. Um, we're not talking here about being patriotic or not. That's not our, that's not our point. Um, the issue here is that they became, and this is the famous idea that one of the few things the Jews had going for them was they retained some semblance of Jewish tradition. You know, name, language, clothing. There was some semblance of, of, of Jewish tradition. So the point is that the, the masses of the people were struggling. So they, were still, they were still from an Amnoes, a foreign nation which still speaks to the fact that there was something different about them, but they were really becoming part of this nation. They were losing their identity as a people. That, that, that's, that's how the Malbim explains it. Um, Rav Hirsch says a, a really beautiful thought, and he has a number of thoughts connected to this in the whole story of the Exodus, that what kept Cloud Israel's identity even in Egypt, what made the Egyptians a foreign nation, was mishpacha, was family, was the home. So because it was a base Yaakov, the house of Jacob, a, a, a family, a connection, uh, that's what kept them. And this, of course, uh, is an idea of her speaks at great length in the story of, of the Exodus from Egypt about the importance of the, the, the Jewish family and tradition and one generation passing on to the next, but just an interesting thing to think about. So now that the Jewish people have left Egypt, Judah, which is another name for the Jewish people, could sanctify God. Yisrael mam shlosav. That cloud Israel became those who God governed. What does that mean? So the Radak says that what it means is we no longer were servants to Pharaoh. We were now only under God. We were not under Egypt anymore. By the way, I, I, I neglected to mention before, we asked, why don't we say Hal on Purim? So, so one of the answers is because the Megillah is, 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 is Hal. The other famous answer in the Gemara is we said in the beginning of the first chapter that the servants of God praise, uh, praise him. And if we're servants to someone else, that, that it's some, that's not our fault, but the reality is we can't exclusively say we're the servants of God. So the bottom line is in the Purim story, the Purim story is not about freedom from, uh, from Akash Verosh. The Purim story is it just, you know, that, that, that problem turned out okay. But we still were under Akash Verosh. We still couldn't serve God exclusively how we wanted to. We were still kind of under someone else's dominion. So, but in any event, when, when the Jewish people leave Egypt, Yisrael Mam Shlosav, we were totally under the governance of God. Um, the Malbim says that Klal Yisrael was a vehicle through which God could prove his control over the world. Because there were all these miracles in nature that God performed in the context of the Exodus from Egypt. So we, the Jewish people, were an opportunity for God to prove his dominion over nature. Okay. Hayom Ra'av Ayonos the sea saw and fled. Hayardain yisof liachor. The Jordan moved back. Hearim raktu chelim givaos kivnei tzom. The the mountains fled like rams. The hills like lambs. They're all moving out of out of out of Cloud Israel's way. The water. The mountains, the Radak says, the mountains referring to here are the mountains that were surrounding Har Sinai. Whereas right? when Klausur was coming to Har Sinai, you know, the, the, there used to be mountains, they just moved out of the way. But the point is, however literally you do or don't understand this, the, the, the point is that obstacles, God moved obstacles out of our way, which is something figuratively we can certainly relate to today, right? That, that there are times, it's fascinating, the, the Ramban says there are two types of miracles there are two types of miracles. One type of miracle is a miracle that's supposed to make a point to the world. And he says those types of miracles that happen during the times of the Chumash are all written about in the Chumash. There's another type of miracle that 
God needed someone to get from point A to point B. And the only way to get them from point A to point B was to do some miracle to get them to point B. But it wasn't to make a point, it was just because something needed to happen. It's just those doesn't even write about them in the Torah. That doesn't mean it didn't happen, it just doesn't even write about them. There are miracles like that all the time in our lives. They might not be obvious, but, but if, if we can see the hand of God, that things just worked out a certain way, it didn't have to be the sea split. But I, I got from point A to point B, and, and when I look back, how did that ever work? What were the odds that, that would have happened? Malcha yam ki sanus. So now we address ourselves to the water. Why should you flee? Hayardain ti sofli achor. Jordan, why do you have to move back? Hayarim ter kaduchi elim gvaos kibnei tzom. You know, hills, mountains. Why, why are you moving left and right? And the answer is, mulifnei adon chuli aris. That I move because of the master of the, the land moves because of the master. The, the land moves in the, because before the God of Jacob. So the, the Radak explains that God manifests his dominion over the world through his taking care of the Jewish people. At least in this story, that's how it happens. That God took the rock and made it into a, fount, uh, you know, a, a, a fountain of water, a pond of water, excuse me, and, and took this rock and turned it into a flowing fountain. And this, of course, refers to the rock in the desert. The Jewish people were given the waters from the rock in the desert. But, so the last chapter ended off with a dramatic turning of nature, the woman who was barren to having children. And now we do a really dramatic turning of nature, which is the fact that you could have a rock and water could flow from this rock. So this is the Exodus in a nutshell. God took care of us. God took us out to, to leave Egypt. The, 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 the laws of nature were totally suspended for the sake of the Jewish people. And it happened because it's God and it's his world and we're his people. And that, that's really the chapter in a nutshell. Any comments or questions? Yeah, Linda. It's interesting. Um, I mean, I, I'll tell you, I don't know if this is the answer or not. Um, what I would think is, let me just repeat the question. The question is, we got the, we just spoke before about what makes it so well for Cloudy so referred to as Israel. So here, gosh, you know, everything's going great. Which we should, he should be referred to as the God of Israel, not of Jacob. So I, I think the point is that the, he's our God. And even if we weren't perfect when we left Egypt, once he decided he was going to do something for the Jewish people, even if, and, and by the way, at the, city, at the splitting of the sea, it's a famous thing. It's also something interesting to think about in the context of Halo. So the Pesukim are fascinating. The Jewish people are standing at the sea, and they pray to God. So literally the next passage, they see the Egyptians coming, and they say to Moshe, why would you take us out of Egypt? So what were they doing? Were they praying to God or were they complaining? You're right, right, yes. Um, so one shot is one shot is some of them are doing one, and some of them are doing the other. So there's another shot. They, uh, they pray to God. They close the sitter. Their prayers were not answered. So then they turn to motion. They say, we prayed. It didn't work. Obviously, this was a mistake that you took us out of Egypt. And so then... If they only would have waited a little bit longer, they would have seen that there was about to be a tremendous miracle. But the point is, whichever shot you go with, by the way, it speaks to the fact that they weren't perfect as they left Egypt. They were, they were, they were growing, they were becoming greater, but they were still a very flawed people, and we're still a very flawed people. And, and the, 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 the thought that God can do great things for us because we're a realm, maybe Beis Yaakov, maybe we should say better, warts and all, he still has a special affection for us as long as we're growing, as long as we're trying. I think it's a worthwhile thing to, to reflect on, and perhaps that's part of the point here. By the way, there's a totally separate thing, which is probably the, the real answer now that I rambled. Those other, um, there's a, um, um, oh no, never mind. 
Let's go with the first answer. <laughs> yeah, Max. My wife didn't even kick me. Yes. Uh, uh, so, you're talking about Jacob, and they, you're talking about Egypt. So, why, why are a lot of the metaphors, I swear, um, goats and sheep and that experience, and it goes back, it continues even after, after we have crossed, uh, uh, we have left Egypt. Why the imagery continue of, uh, I'm just curious, he keeps using that imagery. Uh, I'm sorry, what, which imagery? The imagery of, uh, of Jacob and his sheep continues even into, uh, in, through our, this, uh, this. I'm not, I'm not sure, it's an interesting, I, I'm not sure why the image is like rams and like lambs, I, I, like sheep, I, I'm not, I'm not sure it's a reference to the Corbin Pesach, I don't know if that's what you're, what, what you're, I'm, I, I, to, in my mind, it's this image of animals that are just fleeing. Like, I, I, why specifically these animals? I really don't know. Um, it is it is possible that there's a value here in terms of reference to the Korban. I suppose you're you're connected to Korban Pesach. No, no, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I just always assume that it's these that in his mind it's these classic images of the animals fleeing. Like, but I don't know if anyone knows something. Sorry, if anyone knows something, Stuart. Yeah. But I have a different question. So does anyone, anyone have any ideas about that? No. Yeah, Linda? It's just, it's just like these animals are like, they're known to these people. So the analogy makes a lot of sense, especially when we're talking about Dominic and Mala, the sheep, the things, things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that he, can, he can relate to them. But I think it's just, if you're talking about how the mountains separated us and people were approaching um, our Sinai, that it is a continuation after um, the splitting of the Red Sea that this, 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 this movement um, glorifying God and that God control with nature continued to Harsina. So it's not as if it was only specifically for the splitting of the Red Sea, but it was also for the next event. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Stuart? I understand the reference to the sea. Obviously, that's the crossing of the Red Sea from the end of Egypt. Is the reference to Jordan supposed to reflect coming into Eretz Israel? I, I, I assume. Yeah, thank you. I was debating with that. That thank you. So I assume that the significance of talking about the Jordan is that there's a nice connector. By the way, uh, shameless plug for anyone interested. We're studying Sefer Yoshua at the Wednesday class, eleven o'clock, eleven to twelve. But uh, one interesting, an interesting theme that we've been seeing in these weeks is there are numerous connections between the splitting of, of, of the Yamsuf and the splitting of the Jordan. And it's particularly significant because Yoshua is the leader now, and this is his, the beginning of his leadership. And so this is, in many ways, it's God's way of showing the people that they, what he was able to do for them with Moshe, he can do for them with Yoshua. And, but there's, there's a very powerful connection here. It's kind of like the A to Z of the story. In other words, when they're leaving Egypt, the sea is splitting. When they're ultimately getting to Israel, which of course we know is, is 40 years later, the sea is splitting there too. God, it wasn't a, it wasn't a flash in the pan, so to say. That, that's, I think that's part of the significance here. I mean, yeah, thank you. Okay, I would like to start the next, the next chapter. Um, I don't think we'll finish it, but we'll start it. Again, it's 634. Now this is the first example of where it makes a difference whether you're saying the half or whole Hallel. It's interesting, so if you just look for a moment, this chapter that we skip, let's say on Rosh Chodesh, is actually the beginning of the chapter. In other words, the, the, the second half of the chapter is, is what we, we say on every day, if everyone's with me here. Uh, and the idea seems to be that there were two chapters that the rabbis felt were in some sense, you could boil it down in the end and you could get more or less the gist of the whole thing. That clearly there was a point to the beginning, but the rabbis wanted to have the full hollow experience, but they wanted to make a distinction between certain days and other days. So there were two chapters, obviously there was, both of them were on the longer side, relatively, but there were two chapters that they, but of both of them, they actually omitted the first part and left the second part. So this, these words are so famous which of course, lo lanu, is traditionally some of the loudest words of halal because if it's a day that it's whole halal, at least in shul, everybody needs to make sure that everyone else says a whole halal, and everyone also needs to make sure that everyone knows that I knew to say a whole halal, so we have to say lo lanu very loudly. Um, you ever wonder why Yalav Yavar are the loudest words of Shmona Esrei, by the way? Um, there's, 
there's an interesting uh, Swas MS. The Swas MS says that there's a difference between Halil and Hoda. And it's particularly interesting because for Hanukkah we say these are days of Lahodos u Lahalil, to give thanks and to praise, but there's a difference between the two. So the Svasemis says that Lahodos or Hoda is to say thank you to God for good things in my life. Halil is now that I saw this good thing in my life, I have a broader picture of praise of you. I can extrapolate based on the experience to a much broader understanding of you. And the Sfasem, it's very similar to what we said before with the Malbim, the difference in Halal and Bracha, by the way, if people remember what we said in the first part. So the Sfasem says that what we're saying here when we say Lo Lanu is the purpose of this praise is much bigger than us. The purpose of this praise is much broader than you did something very nice in my life. It's that I gain a whole new understanding of you. And that I can share that whole new understanding with others. So, the, 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 again, this is certainly not the, the literal meaning, but it's a very interesting thing to think about. Lo lanu Hashem, lo lanu. It's not for us, God. It's not for us. Ki l'shim kavod. It's to give honor to your name. So, it, it's, again, this is not the literal meaning, but it's, it's interesting that one of the greatest benefits of praise is not only thanking him for things in my life, but gaining a whole new perspective based on that praise. That's an interesting... Okay. Um, so, the Radak says that Lo Lanu is really a follow-up on the previous chapter. So if I were to ask you, after reading the previous chapter, why did the Jewish people have the sea split for them? What's the answer to that question? It's not because of the Jewish people, right? We ask the sea, why are you splitting? And it says, we, the sea says, I'm splitting because of God. So it's about God, it's not about his people. It's God who's kind of doing it for his people. So therefore, as a follow-up to that, says the Radak, we say to God, you know what? We're getting this. Do great things for us too. Not because we deserve it, but because teach the world today that there's a God and, and, and that that God runs the world. So, I'm not, asking you, I'm, I'm not asking you to bring peace to Israel because I think that the Jewish people definitively deserve it. I don't know if they deserve it or not. But you know what? It would impress people a lot if God can bring peace to Israel. And whether or not we deserve it, it would be a tremendous Kiddush Hashem, a glorification of God's name. Just as an example. Let people see your kindness. Let people see your truth. Um, Rav Hirsch says that we said in the previous chapter that Klal Yisrael is Mam Shalosav, that we are governed by God. Which means that our lives are about the service of God. Our lives are about something greater and broader than my interests of the moment. My, our lives are about following God's Torah and, his, and what he lays out for us, his mission, etc., so the first says, that's what we're saying in this chapter. You know what, God? When we ask for things, this, this definitely fits with things we spoke about in the Shimon Esri series. When we ask for things, we're asking because if you give us something that helps us, that'll help us serve you in a better way. I'm not, I, I don't want health for its own sake. Lo lanu Hashem lo lanu. It's not for us. Ki l'shim about Help us in all different ways to give glory to your name. Because if you help me, I'm motivated, because I, I thought about what we said, Yisrael Mam Shlosav, that we're governed by you. If you help me, I'll do things that you want me to do in this world. That, that's, that's how Rav Hirsch understands the, the line. Um, okay, let's, let's just do a trap more. Uh, we'll, we'll, just, we'll end in a few minutes. L'lolonu Hashem l'lolonu kishim chotein kavod al chastacha al amitacha. God, give glory to your Kindness and your truth. Why in the world should the nations look at us and say, where are their God? Where, where is the Jewish God? Why should they say that? 
And it's, it's such a vexing thing. Because our God is very much in heaven. Everything that he desires, he does. Rav Hur says they are, the very question of where is their God implies, again, we're, we're talking about an idol-worshipping people when we say this. We're talking about people who don't believe in monotheism. The very question of where is the Jewish God emphasizes the, their limited perspective for people who, who can't view monotheism. Because if I can't see it, it must not exist. That's Where is their God? And we say we, we don't think it's a, very, it's a very profound question. Our God is in heaven. On the other hand, their idols, that's crazy. Atzabeim, Kesef is up. Their idols are, are silver and gold. Maasei de Adam. Just the, the, the handiwork of man. I can see a mouth from their idols, and yet the mouth doesn't speak. I can see eyes, but the eyes don't see. I can see ears, but the ears don't hear. I can see a nose, but the nose doesn't smell. They have hands that they can't feel. They have feet and they can't walk. They, they can't uh, promote sound with their throats. All those who have faith in them will be like them. Now what does that mean? So the Radak says it as a prayer. That basically let all those people who worship idols ultimately have no more ability than the idol. Rav Hirsch and many others say something along the lines of if you put your life focus in something that's nothing, your life is nothing. That, that's, not a, that's not a curse, that's not a prayer, it's a statement of fact. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll close on this. I, I, once, I once heard a story, I think I heard the story from a tape from Rabbi Frant, that uh, there was a person who worked for many years for a certain company and uh, the company was laying off a number of its workers, and uh, this person, unfortunately, was being laid off, and, and the people were being laid off en masse, and so there was a whole protocol on, on people's last day, what happened? And so everyone had their box, and they, they, they brought their box with them, and at the exit, there was a security guard who would check the box to make sure you weren't taking anything that belonged to the company, you weren't taking any computers, any pens, whatever. So uh, this fellow worked 40 years for one company, and now he's unceremoniously is, is uh, let go. So, um, so he's standing there with his box, and the security guard is carefully going through every item in the box. He, and he says, excuse me, sir, I need to see if anything here belongs to the company. I have no idea if this story is true, but either way, it's very powerful. The person rips open his shirt, and he starts pounding his chest. He says, you want to know what belongs to the company? This belongs to the company. Very sad story. And again, whether it's exactly, we can certainly relate it to whether experiences we've had with experiences we've seen of others. And it's a powerful thing. What, what am I putting my energies into? So this is really, at least according to one understanding, the statement being made here. And it, it's such a powerful thing to think about as we say Hallel, that we, we thank God for doing this for us and doing that for us and saving our people and miracles of Hanukkah, all this, and, and wonderful things in our own lives. But perhaps the greatest thing for which we thank God is the fact that we have a God. And the fact that we have that understanding and the fact that we have that clarity and the fact that we have that purpose and mission that so many others don't merit to have in their lives. And we have it. And it, it's a tremendous bracha that we have that. And so, so people who unfortunately their lives revolve around idol worship. In the end of the day, what does this person have to speak for in their life? Their, their lives revolve around something that they themselves made. It's a tragedy. So we, we haven't even finished this, this subsection of a paragraph, but we'll, we'll continue next time, God willing. And, uh, thank you very much.
Maybe you can address it next week. Um, the, the thesis that the first half is covered by the second half is going to be the four and a half by words. Because if you look at it, the first half is very negative. It's all about the idols and right. I mean, it's